This chapter 1 lays out the basic mechanics and pricing principles of repos and their reverse transactions, known commonly as reverse repos. Under a classic repo, a bondholder sells a bond to a counterparty under an agreement to repurchase the same or equivalent bonds on a stipulated future date, usually at the same price plus an extra amount representing the time value of money. Thus, in the simplest example, the seller sells the securities for 100 and agrees to repurchase them three months later for the same 100 as the initial price plus an extra one for time value of money. There is an ambiguity here we should clear up immediately. Some practitioners would say that the repurchase price is 100 and the repo interest is 1, while others define the repurchase price to include the repo interest. Under this latter approach, the excess of the repurchase price over the initial sale price represents the implicit interest that the bondholder is paying to his counterparty for the use of the funds during the period of the repo. Economically, the two approaches are entirely equivalent, of course, but care must be taken to specify what meaning is being used, something we will attempt to do each time the need arises. For the repurchase leg, equivalent bonds are defined to mean bonds from the same issuer and series, and therefore having the same maturity date, coupon, and serial number as the original bonds, but not necessarily the exact same bonds. Indeed, the standardized documentation for repo refers to the repurchase of equivalent securities, quote unquote, rather than of the original securities. Since the bonds repurchased are not necessarily the same bonds exactly as the ones sold on day one, the word repurchase is technically incorrect, but given its common usage by all market practitioners and by the standardized repo documentation, we will use it as well. In fact, precise use of language in this area is essential given how loosely some terms are thrown around in the marketplace and therefore how easy it is to get confused. We will address this issue in just a moment. An arithmetical example will serve to illustrate the basics of a repo. Suppose Alcatel has a series of bonds due December 31, 2020 and paying an annual coupon of 6% under a 3360 convention and that these bonds are trading at a clean price of 102 on June 30, 2012. You should readily be able to confirm that the dirty price of these bonds is 105. Assume now that Party A owns 10 million dollars in face value of these bonds and wishes to repo them with Party B until August 31, 2012. Assume also that the two parties agree that the price under the initial sale will be 105 or specifically 10.5 million dollars while the repurchase price will exceed the initial sale price by an amount that represents a 2% annualized return for Party B on his funds under an actual 360 day count convention. Since there are 62 actual days between June 30 and August 31, the price differential works out to this quantity here. So the aggregate repurchase price, including the return on Party B's funds for the 62 days at 2%, becomes this quantity here. The diagram appearing now shows the sale by Party A to Party B on June 30, 2012 of Alcatel bonds having a face value of 10 million in return for payment by Party B to Party A of 10.5 million dollars. 
In saying that this exchange occurs on June 30, 2012, we are ignoring for the sake of simplicity the T plus 1, T plus 2, or whatever settlement convention normally applies in the specific bond market, and will continue to do so throughout this module. Then on August 31, 2012, Party A repurchases the Alcatel bonds from Party B in return for payment by Party A to Party B of 10,536,000 and change. We should mention at this point that the transaction is called a repo transaction from Party A's perspective, but a reverse repo transaction from Party B's. Of course, every repo is also a reverse repo for the other party and vice versa. While the transaction is structured legally as a sale and purchase, you should recognize readily that its economic effect has been to provide ten and a half million dollars of secured financing to Party A for 62 days at the 2% interest rate. At the end of the transaction, Party A is once again the owner of the Alcatel bonds, and Party B has recovered his funds plus interest exactly the same outcome, economically speaking, that would have arisen if the two parties had simply agreed to a $10.5 million loan for 62 days at 2% collateralized by the Alcatel bonds. But, unlike a collateralized financing, title to the Alcatel bonds actually transfers from Party A to Party B during the 62 days financing period which ensures that Party B has unquestioned title to the securities and can use them for any purpose from the moment that title has transferred, including to on-sell them or pledge them in its own trading activities for any purpose. Furthermore, Party B will be able to liquidate the securities in the event of a default by Party A on or prior to the repurchase date, to recover his principal and accrued interest more easily and with greater legal certainty than if he merely held the securities as collateral. This economic similarity between repos and collateralized loans is essential to understanding many of the pricing and risk management aspects of these transactions. It is also, however, the source of much ambiguity in the language used by market practitioners, which we address next. To minimize confusion and maintain consistency, for the most part with standardized documentation, we will refer to Party A as the seller and Party B as the buyer. We will refer to the Alcatel bonds as the bonds, or the purchase securities, or the collateral. To the initial price on day one as the purchase price and to the price at which the bonds are returned to Party A at expiration inclusive of the return on Party B's funds as the repurchase price. We will refer to the difference between these two prices as the repo interest which annualized becomes the repo interest rate. Be warned, however, of the following common uses of terms in the marketplace. The seller is often called the lender since he is quote-unquote lending out his bonds to the counterparty, a practice we find especially confusing since he is in fact borrowing cash. Similarly, the buyer is often called the bondholder, which is true for the 62-day duration of the transaction, but risks being confused with the status of the seller as original bondholder. The buyer is also sometimes referred to as the investor, since he is investing his cash for the duration of the repo, 
and even more confusing as the borrower, since he is in effect borrowing the purchase securities from the seller for the duration of the repo. Note that under this usage, this results in the buyer being the borrower of the securities and the lender of the cash, while the seller becomes the lender of the securities and the borrower of the cash. Finally, we will describe the seller as repoing out or reversing out the purchase securities and the buyer as repoing them in or reversing them in. Here there is fortunately little inconsistency in market practice. Again, we cannot emphasize enough how critical it is to maintain consistency of terminology throughout this discussion. It is helpful to lay out the key calculations of repo transactions via formulas. Thus, for a standard repo, we can write that purchase price equals face value of purchase securities times the sum of the clean price plus the accrued interest divided by 100, and also that the repurchase price equals the purchase price times 1 plus the repo rate times actual over 360 or 365, where you will note that we are defining the repurchase price to include the repo interest, a source of ambiguity we first mentioned at the beginning of this chapter. Unfortunately, some formulas will become more complicated when we account for margin in the upcoming sections. Worksheet pricing allows you to derive both of these items by inputting the face value of the purchase securities in cell C3, their clean price in C4, coupon rate and most recent coupon payment date in cells C5 and C6, the transaction purchase date in C7, transaction repurchase date in C8, the repo interest rate in C9, and the day count convention for the market in question in C10. Please note, however, that this model assumes the purchase securities pay coupons according to a 3360 convention. The purchase price is then calculated in cell C13 and the aggregate purchase price including the repo interest in cell C14. You can also use this worksheet to reverse out the repo interest rate if you know all the inputs above and also the repurchase price but not the repo rate. Suppose for example that the repurchase price is $10.55 million exactly. You would now click on this cell C14, then go to Goal Seek and set this cell equal to $10,550,000 by changing cell C9 and hit OK revealing the repo interest rate to be 2.76% instead of 2%. Now assume that during the tenor of the repo, Party A suddenly needs the Alcatel bonds back, but has other securities of comparable quality and market value he can deliver in exchange, say from General Electric. There is presumably no reason to deny Party A the ability to effect the substitution of the GE securities for those from Alcatel. The parties therefore often agree up front in the documentation on a predefined substitution right in favor of party A 
specifying the minimum quality and other characteristics of securities eligible as substitutes and also typically a total number of permitted substitutions over the life of the transaction. The specification as to quality could be based on minimum credit rating, maximum maturity, seniority, and similar criteria. The number of substitutions permitted, meanwhile, is clearly a benefit for Party A and would, in principle, affect the pricing of the transaction, with Party A paying a higher repo rate on the funds obtained on day one to reflect the optionality he has acquired by way of the substitution privilege. This ties into a second related aspect of repos, namely the operational difficulties it can represent for parties that are not active dealers in securities, such as cash-rich corporates or even certain buy-and-hold institutional investors who are not really able to monitor and handle some of the operational aspects of frequent securities delivery and substitution. Two solutions are possible here. The first, commonly known as held-in-custody repo, exempts the seller from full delivery of the underlying securities, requiring him instead to hold those securities in a custodial account administered by him for the benefit of the buyer. This is administratively easier for the buyer and provides savings for the two parties since they no longer are undertaking full settlement through the external settlement system relating to the underlying securities. However, it generates for the buyer a risk of fraud on the part of the seller, whose word the buyer in effect is taking as to the appropriate segregation of the underlying securities. In a number of cases some three decades ago, Sellers in such situations were found to have repoed the same securities twice or more with different counterparties, generating large losses for their counterparties when the sellers became insolvent and the buyer could not establish clear title to the underlying securities. A widely used alternative that mitigates the above problem is for a third-party agent to be appointed to hold the collateral subject to all repo transactions between two parties. These third parties may be individual banks, with JP Morgan and Bank of New York particularly prominent in the US market for example, and securities clearing associations such as Clearstream and Euroclear active in the European market. Under these arrangements, known as tri-party repo arrangements, the seller continues to have full control over his inventory, while the buyer incurs minimal settlement costs, yet enjoys the tri-party's independent confirmation that its cash is fully collateralized. Smaller players in the repo market, on either side of the trade, are especially attracted to tri-party repo due to the following benefits. They no longer need to install repo settlement and monitoring systems. They do not need to monitor market movements and margin requirements, an aspect of repos we will discuss very shortly. They do not take delivery of collateral or need to maintain an account at the clearing association and they may even in certain cases delegate to the third party agent the obligation to implement default measures and remedies in the event of a counterparty default. We now address what happens if a coupon is paid on the purchase securities during the term of the repo. Assume for this purpose that the purchase date is November 30, 2012, while the repurchase date is still 62 days later, i.e. January 31, 2013. 
assume also that the clean price is still 102. You should have no difficulty verifying that the dirty price is 107.50, but can use our preceding worksheet to confirm this if you need to. This leads to a purchase price of 10,750,000 and a repurchase price of this quantity here, inclusive of repo interest. But on December 31, 2012, Alcatel will pay a coupon of 600000 to the registered holder of the purchase securities, which will be Party B at that time. Quite simply, Party B is required under the agreement to pay over to Party A on the same date an amount equal to the amount of the coupon it has received. Essentially returning to Party A the coupon it would have received if the repo transaction had never happened or if it had been structured instead as a loan collateralized with the Alcatel bonds. This payment from Party B to Party A is often referred to as a quote-unquote manufactured coupon, a term that would become manufactured dividend if the purchase securities underlying the repo were equities rather than bonds. We will make an important observation in a later chapter about how the manufactured coupon or dividend is calculated when a withholding tax is imposed by the issuer's jurisdiction. We turn next to a key aspect of the risk management of repos, namely the use of margin. Assume that Party B is a superior credit to Party A and is worried about his exposure to Party A should Party A fail to pay the repurchase price and the repo interest on the repurchase date. The two parties therefore agree to an initial margin of 2% which means that the parties will reduce the initial purchase price for the collateral to a level that causes the ratio of the bond's initial value, including accrued interest, to the initial price to be 102% or 102. Since on day one, the value of the bonds is 10,500,000, including accrued interest, the purchase price will be reduced to 10,500,000 divided by 1.02, which is this quantity here. Note that this causes the repurchase price, inclusive of accrued repo interest, to shrink as well, becoming this quantity here. In other words, both the purchase price and the repurchase price have shrunk in absolute terms, although the repo interest rate paid by Party A has remained the same in percentage terms, but is applied on a smaller amount of financing. Now since the value of the bonds on the purchase date is still $10.5 million, Party B is assured that if Party A defaults and provided the price of the bonds has not changed significantly by the repurchase date, Party B will hold bonds worth more than what it is owed by Party A which Party B can sell in order to recover the funds he is owed, including the interest at the repo rate. Setting the level of this margin is part science and part judgment. To some degree a higher margin is logical with a less creditworthy counterparty, since the probability that the collateral will need to be liquidated is higher, but generally, the identity of the counterparty is a minor factor here. The larger factor is the volatility of the collateral. With highly liquid and creditworthy bonds, such as US and UK Treasuries, attracting the smallest haircuts, often as little as 2%, while high-grade corporate bonds are haircut at perhaps 3 to 5%, depending on their credit rating. Equities at 10% or more and emerging market securities often by substantially higher amounts. Also, 
haircuts during liquidity crises can rise substantially, as was experienced with structured finance securities in the 2007-2008 meltdown, with haircuts often doubling or tripling depending on their illiquidity and complexity. But what if the bond's value diminishes significantly over the life of the transaction? Here, the market has adopted a classical mechanism for marking to market the position and imposing variation margin requirements on one or both parties to maintain the minimum stipulated margin. Unfortunately, the specifics of how this works are a little cumbersome, as with all margining mechanisms, so we devote significant time in this chapter to this issue. For now, we assume the mark-to-market mechanism is applied only on a monthly basis, but we will see later that it is most commonly carried out daily. Assume that on July 31, 2012, the Alcatel bonds have been downgraded, so that their clean price now is only 98. With seven months having passed since the most recent coupon payment, the dirty price is therefore 101.5. Party B is now exposed to the fault by Party A, since it would not be able to recover its money in full if Party A were to default. As of this moment in time, interest has accrued on the purchase price at 2% for 31 days, so the total amount owed by Party A to Party B has increased to this quantity here. Multiplying this number by 102% gives us this quantity here. This exceeds by some $360,000 the current value of the Alcatel bonds, so Party A is obligated to deliver to Party B cash or securities whose value equals the shortfall. Assuming Party A is able to deliver Alcatel bonds from the same series, we calculate the face value of those bonds as follows. First, we note that since their dirty price is 101.5, the aggregate face value of bonds Party B needs to have in its possession becomes this quantity here. This exceeds the amount Party B is already holding by 362,000 and change. Assuming the Alcatel bonds are issued in minimum denominations of $1,000, Party A would therefore deliver to Party B an additional amount of such bonds having a face value equal to $363,000. The repurchase date and repurchase price remain unchanged, very importantly. You will note that under this approach, the principal amount of the financing remains unchanged throughout the life of the transaction. It is the amount of bonds delivered by Party A that gets adjusted, and specifically increased, to meet the minimum margin requirement. This is obviously desirable if the principal motivation behind the transaction was to provide a fixed amount of financing to Party A for the duration of the transaction. If this is not absolutely necessary, then Party A could simply hand over to Party B cash in an amount equal to the shortfall described above, i.e. 362000 and change. The marketplace and the standardized repo documentation provide for additional methods of re-establishing the minimum margin which we describe next. The first of these is called the close out and repricing method with adjustment of the securities amount and works as follows. First, we calculate the amount of money party A would owe to party B if the transaction terminated today. In our specific example, this would be the 10,300,000 and change amount we calculated a little while ago. 
We pretend for a minute that this amount is paid in full by party A to party B, but you will see at the end that everything is netted out to the greatest extent possible. Second, the parties establish a new transaction at the same repo rate and based on the same amount of financing as the original transaction, i.e. 10,294,000 and changed. Adjusting for the minimum margin, the value of the securities purchased must be 10.5 million, a number we saw earlier, of course. At the current dirty price of 101.5, the face value of these securities must therefore be this quantity here, or 10,345,000 when rounded up as necessary. If we now combine the two steps above into one, i.e. the termination of the original transaction and the establishment of a new transaction for the month of August, much of what is transferred back and forth nets out. Thus, as you can see on the diagram appearing now, the closeout of the original transaction involves the return of the 10 million face value of Alcatel bonds against payment in cash of 10.3 million and change. The establishment of the new transaction involves the sale of Alcatel bonds with a face value of 10,345,000 against a purchase price of 10.294 million and change. These net out to the mere delivery by party A of bonds with face value of 345,000 plus the payment by party A of $17,728 in cash. You can probably see that this cash amount represents nothing more than one month of interest at the 2% repo rate applied to the initial purchase price. In essence, Party A is prepaying the 31 days of interest that have accrued so far on the transaction then also delivering additional Alcatel bonds to re-establish the minimum margin required under the agreement. A month later, when the transaction matures on August 31, 2012, Party B returns the entire 10.345 million of Alcatel bonds to Party A, who pays to Party B in cash an amount equal to 10.3 million and change. This representing the 10.294 million plus interest at the repo rate for the month of August. The identity of this number for interest with the one we saw a minute ago stems from the fact that the number of days in July and August is the same and that each month accounted for exactly half the tenor of the transaction. Reality is likely to be a little more cumbersome in most cases. You have probably noted that the early payment of repo interest by Party A in the example above results in a slight economic injustice to it and benefit to Party B, since Party A would need to finance this amount one month early and would thus pay interest on interest, so to speak, until the repo maturity date. This is not a large amount, but if Party A objects to it nonetheless, the two parties could agree to postpone the date of payment of the 17,728 until the final maturity date. However, this would increase Party B's exposure to Party A and would therefore require an increase in the amount of Alcatel bonds delivered to re-establish the 2% minimum margin requirement. We leave it to you to determine what this amount would be as an exercise. The final method available to deal with margin calls is known as the closeout and repricing method with adjustment of the cash amount. This works according to the following steps. As before, 
we first calculate the amount of money party A would owe to party B if the transaction terminated today. Again, this would be the 10.3 million and change we calculated a little while ago. Again, we pretend for a minute that this amount is paid by party A to party B, but you will see at the end once again that everything is netted out to the greatest extent possible. Second, the parties calculate the new dirty market price of the existing Alcatel bonds, which is of course 10,150,000. Third, the parties calculate the new amount of financing that could be provided against these bonds, taking into account the 2% margin requirement, and they establish a new transaction on the basis of this smaller amount. This amount is simply this quantity here. If we now combine all the above steps into one, as before, i.e. the termination of the original transaction and the establishment of a new transaction for the month of August, much of what is transferred forth and back nets out once again. Thus, as you can see on the diagram appearing now, the closeout of the original transaction involves the return of the 10 million face value of Alcatel bonds against payment in cash of 10.3 million and change. The establishment of the new transaction involves the sale of Alcatel bonds with face value of 10 million against the purchase price of 9,950,000 and change. These all net out to the mere payment by party A to party B of 360,000 and change in cash. And as you might expect, now that the principal amount of the financing has diminished to 9,950,000 and change, the repurchase price for the Alcatel bonds at maturity will now equal this quantity here. As before, the economics of this method are slightly less beneficial to party A since it is effectively paying some repo interest early. We may have given you the impression that the buyer of the securities is always the party who benefits from margin and thus becomes over collateralized and not the other way around. And indeed this is normally the case since the buyer is the lender of cash. But in instances in which the buyer is a substantially inferior credit to the seller, the positions could be reversed. After all, if the value of the underlying securities rises after inception of the repo and the buyer at maturity defaults on his obligation to return those securities to the seller, the seller will, of course, hold on to the repurchase price plus repo interest to mitigate his loss. But a loss he will still have since the value of the securities could be substantially higher than the total cash he owes Party B. In such instances, therefore, Party A may insist up front on being the over-collateralized party, in which case the initial purchase price is set on day one to be higher than the fair market value of the securities, say by 2%, rather than the other way around. Returning to our initial example in which the Alcatel bonds have a clean price of 102, and a dirty price of 105 as of June 30, we set the initial purchase price this time by multiplying the dirty price by 102 instead of dividing it by this number. So the initial purchase price becomes this quantity here, 10,710,000, and assuming the repo interest rate is still 2%, the repo interest over the life of the transaction is calculated as this quantity here, or 36,890, causing the aggregate repurchase price, inclusive of repo interest, 
to become 10,746,000 and change which means that party A is the one that now benefits from over collateralization. To complete the example, suppose the clean price of the Alcatel bonds instantly rises by three points and becomes 105, so that the dirty price is now around 108, and party A is no longer over collateralized. Over -collateralized. <laughs> At this point, Party B is obligated to re-establish the 2% margin in favor of Party A, which could be done in a number of ways as before. The simplest of which probably is to return to Party A Alcatel bonds whose market value at that point is around $250,000, while keeping the rest whose value would be some $10.55 million, thereby re-establishing an approximate 2% margin in favor of party A. This completes this chapter 1.